What's up everyone, it's Mike with Confused IT. In this video, I wanna cover how to create a virtual machine in vCenter. In the last video, I covered how to create a virtual machine in ESXi. And in this video, I just wanna cover the, uh, the UI in vCenter and how that might look a little bit different than doing it from the ESXi from the, the host level. So I'm gonna jump right in here. The first thing we're gonna do is right click on um, an object in this menu. Um, if you right clicked in most places in vCenter, you can generally create a new virtual machine. There's only a few places that it doesn't let you do that. Um, generally, probably on a host itself, as a VM itself, rather. Um, you can do it from a host itself. You can do it from a cluster. You can do it from a data center. Um, I just don't think you can do it from this vCenter level. Yeah, so same menu, regardless usually of where you create it from. So we'll go ahead and right click and hit new virtual machine. Uh, from here, we get a list of options, which is a little bit longer than the options we get on the host, the uh, the ESXi host itself. So here we have the option to create a new virtual machine. That's the one we're going to go over today. Um, we can also deploy from a template. You can clone an existing virtual machine. You can clone a virtual machine to a template. You can clone a template to a template, and you can convert a template to a virtual machine, uh, which is a lot of options. So we'll pick the first one today. Hit the next option. Uh, we'll give it a name. I'll leave it as new virtual machine for now. Um, we'll go ahead and expand this here. So this is just some folders I created for organizing my environment. I'm going to put it in the, uh, the lab environment folder. It doesn't really matter too much where you put it. Um, so here we have a choice. This is where it doesn't really matter too much and where you right click and get to this menu for new virtual machine, because here you get to choose where it's going to run. And so even though I picked the cluster, I could put it in another host outside of the cluster. Um, I just can't pick the data center, obviously, because it's not specific enough. So I could pick a cluster, I could pick an ESXi host. Um, depending on where I put it, there may be some different options based on what's supported by the hosts, either individually or in the cluster. Um, so my cluster is older than these two hosts. These two, this host is on 6.7, this host is on 7.0, and this cluster is on 6.5. So there might be some uh, you know, different features available depending on where I put it. So I'm going to put it on the in the cluster for now just because I have more storage there and you can see what uh, that looks like with having more than one storage choice, which is right here. So we have the choice of internal storage on one of the hosts. Um, then we also have a choice of two uh, NFS shares, which are uh, two Synologies in my lab. So I'm going to pick the SSD NAS for the data store for this test VM. Uh, we'll go ahead and hit next. So here's a choice for compatibility level. Uh, in this case, it, it can go as high as 6.5 because that's what those hosts are in the cluster. Um, that's as high as they're going to be able to go is, is 6.5. So that's, you know, 6.5 and up is where we can go with these VMs if I create it. Uh, for example, if I was to go back to, just real quick, I'll hit the back button back to this host, which is 7.0. Uh, and I picked the internal storage for that host, and then we're here again. It's going to pick the 6.5. I think that's because it picks the oldest thing in your vCenter, um, or maybe in your data center level, because that would be the 6.5 host in my case. But in here, I should now see higher options, 6.7 later, 6.7 uh, U2 and later, um, being my workstation choices, and then also the, the 7.0 versions. So um, if I was to create a 7.0 version, it would, I would not be able to move this VM into this cluster that was 6.5 up here. Uh, I would have to keep it on that, that one host that has 7.0. If I put it on 6.7, I could run it on the two hosts that were in my data center, but not the cluster. And again, 6.5, I could run it on any of the hosts in my, um, in my vCenter, the ones that are in the data center, um, the cluster, the, the two other hosts, they, they would all be compatible at this 6.5 uh, level. So, uh, let me go back to that cluster, pick that SSD NAS again, do the 6.5, uh, and in here, I'm going to go ahead and pick Windows Server 2016 or later. Um, but basically here you're just picking your OS and your OS version. So uh, on the host level, we saw that, you know, uh, in ESXi, we saw that there is an option here for Mac. Uh, on vCenter, they merged Mac into other so if you go to other, there's Mac OS. Again, I mentioned before that it doesn't really work uh, on regular hardware. You have to pretty much have a, you know, an Apple piece of hardware, a, a Mac mini running an Intel chip or a Mac Pro with an Intel chip to be able to uh, virtualize Mac. Um, 
there are some workarounds for Windows Server, uh, you know, for non-Apple hardware. But I have noticed that um, after Mac OS Catalina, when they went 64-bit, it became very hard to get it to run for a lot of people. So uh, just a heads up there. If we go to Linux, usual options are in here for, you know, Ubuntu, Red Hat, um, you know, Debian, all the common stuff, CentOS. If we go into Windows, again, same options we saw before. I'm going to go with the Windows Server 2016 or later 64-bit option. Okay, so here we have the virtual hardware settings for the VM that we just created. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show something that used to happen a lot at the uh, the place that I've some of the places that I've worked is, is you know they come in here, they create a new VM, they're on this page, and they just quickly run through. You know, generally the settings at the defaults are fine, but um, here's an example of why sometimes you want to take a little bit deeper of a look at the settings that get created here is. If I make this, uh, let's say I made this an eight core or eight CPU, um, whatever that really means, an eight CPU. So if we expand that right now, we take a deeper look, it's creating one core per socket. Uh, and since it's eight, that means that there's eight sockets and one core each. Now, I haven't seen a lot, you know, I've seen some computers, I haven't seen, and I've seen some servers, and I've seen some, you know, I don't know if I've seen any like super computers out there, or super. You know the the uh, the quantum computer or anything, but I I've never seen anything with eight sockets and an eight CPU socket. So um, I would definitely change this to make it a little bit more realistic. I don't know if there's any. You know, uh, there used to be debates about if there's any harm to this, which there technically probably isn't if you were going to run it. But you know, if for some reason an application wasn't designed to take advantage of eight CPU sockets, you might have some some trouble there. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this to uh, four, which the math adds up, and that ends up with two sockets. Um, all the hosts in my cluster have two CPUs in them, so two sockets, four cores each. Now they definitely have more than four cores each, but at least the sockets adds up and. You know, everything that I should be running, whether it be a Windows server or a Linux server or whatever, they should understand that and it shouldn't be something like really weird that they're not used to. Um, you know, if, again, if it causes any problems to not have it this way, uh, it's probably debatable. Um, but I like to keep it as something that's somewhat realistic and conceptually makes sense to me. So I would do that. Uh, I also wouldn't use an odd number. That could just be superstition on my part. I really don't know. But it just seems odd. I've never seen a three core processor. So, you know, again, three sockets, one core each, very bizarre. Three sockets, uh, sorry, one socket and three cores each also seems kind of bizarre to me. So I would just go with uh, stuff you've seen before because I feel like that, I don't know if it works better, but it just seems like the right thing to do. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Um, I'm not going to go into the rest of these things here. I'll go into those in a different video and kind of explain the options. But the one that you might find interesting is this CPU hot plug. Uh, if you turn this on, basically you're able to add CPU resources while the VM is running. Um, you can't remove them until you power it off, but you can add them while it's on, which is a kind of an, uh, a pretty neat feature. So uh, I don't need that, so I'm going to turn it off or leave it off for now. So the next option here is the memory. Um, I'm going to expand it, but there's really nothing in here you have to worry about. Um, depending on reserving all guest memory, that can be helpful to prevent over-provisioning in a lot of cases, but uh, by default, it, it's not you know crazy just trying to give more memory than you know what you actually have to give, um, or what other you know compare other servers what they're using and you know how much you have available so you don't overburden anything. But yeah, so four gigs is fine here um, for my case. New hard disk, um, yeah. The one thing I would say in here, forty gig. I'm gonna make it sixty five. Doesn't really. It's just a test machine, but. We'll say 65 anyway. Um, the one thing I would change is the di disk provisioning option. Uh, I mentioned this in my ESXi video as well. So the reason here is if you thin provision a disk, um, there's a I would say there's a, a much higher chance of having a uh, over provisioning issue where you know you give one di one VM uh, you know more hard drive space than you actually have. And then you give another VM more hard drive space than you actually have, and all of a sudden, um, you start using storage on those servers, and you know the VMs look fine if you have an RMM client on them. It, 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 there's no reporting issues that you're out of space, but one day you 
you know, max out your data store because they're both thin provisioned and um, they, you know, it doesn't really warn you that well when you're you have an over provisioning issue there. So basically, thick provision means that it reserves the storage ahead of time. Uh, from my understanding, is if you do thick provisioned and you have a 65 gig disk, then it will reserve 65 gigs, so it'll show as used storage when you're looking at your data store. If you thin provision it, it'll show it, you know your data store will only show on what you actually use at the moment that you're you know using the VM. So if you only have a if you have a 65 gig disk and a 25 gigs of air used, then you're only going to see 25 gigs missing from your data store. You're not going to see the 65 that is allocated but not used uh, in total. So it could just create you know over provisioning issues. It's probably a preference, but that is debatable probably. Uh, you know, I'd say personal preference, but probably debatable. Um, thick provision would be my preference there. I would suggest that you use thick provision. Um, and yeah, the rest of the things I'll go over in the video. We'll go into the next section. We'll skip over the, the SCSI controller. That, that should be fine. Uh, the network, I'm going to go ahead and pick my lab network here. Just pick whatever network you'd want this VM to run off of. Um, one suggestion in here is to change the adapter type from E1000E to VMX Net 3. Uh, could also be preference here, but I think that, uh, you know, it's a much better adapter. Uh, the E1000E, I feel like, is an older adapter. It, it holds some more compatibility with other systems where different systems might pick it up and have a built-in driver for it compared to the VMX Net 3, but if you want 10 gig or, um, you know, I think there's like a, probably a slew of features that come with the VMX Net 3 that... I'm probably not even aware of, but yeah, it seems like the better thing to do. And if you change it later, yeah, I've seen issues where, you know, because it, looks, it comes up as a new adapter, you get a new MAC address, it knocks out your static IP configuration, and all of a sudden you have a headache later on compared to now. So I was just changing it. Worst case scenario, you would up the VM. It doesn't have support for it off the bat, uh, you know, out of the gate, and you just have to install VMware tools, and then you're good to go. So VMX Net 3 is, is uh, recommended here for the adapter type. All right, moving along to the next section here, we'll take a look at the CD DVD drive. And I'm going to go ahead and just pick a data store ISO here. For your installers, you know, if you're rooting up and making a VM, just put the ISO on a data store somewhere and select it and mount it as a, as a CD DVD drive. That's probably the easiest way. You know, passing through a uh, a physical DVD drive or a physical flash drive is not a very intuitive way to do it, in my opinion. So, I would say upload an ISO to your data store, keep a repository there for them, and then just pick them and mount them um, when you need them. And so, I'm mounting a Windows Server 2019 uh, installer right now. So, I have this uh, connected at power on. As soon as I power it up, it'll be attached and it'll boot up to it. Uh, I'm going to leave the USB controller alone. The video cards, only thing here, it, it sets it to an automatic uh, or custom setting. Um, you could choose auto detect. It really, you know, it's really kind of a, uh, a decision you have to make after you boot it up, I would say. You know, eight's a good place to start. If you boot it up and you, f you feel like there is, you know, the resolution's not good and you can't find any more Resolution choices like you go to change your, your screen resolution and there's a bunch missing you, you can only go up to uh, Let's say, you know um, 720p or something and you want to go to 1920 by 1080 or higher or whatever this option is probably limiting those choices so Or VMware tools install VMware tools come back here. That doesn't fix it You know come back here and change that total memory increase it a little bit to a higher number and the more that this number goes up the more choices you should have for your uh, screen resolution options. So I'm gonna leave it at eight for now. The default is uh, is fine there. All right. So another section here is if you need another disk, uh, you need another hard drive, you need another um, you know network adapter, you want to pass through a video card, something along those lines. Go to the add new device up here, and you'll just click on these options, and you'll be able to add an additional hard drive or add an additional network adapter, and you'll have the options to configure it just like these ones, like. I guess I'll give you a quick example here. If I click on hard disk, now I have another hard disk. And I can come in here and configure it with this, whatever settings I want it to have. Um, you can even choose a different data store location, um, which is in here. You can browse and put it on a different data store. Um, and then you can just remove it right here in the corner. So that's how you can add a disk. The the you know, based off that, the the network uh, 
adapter option is also very similar and straightforward. So um, we'll go on to the next section. The VMware options are here. I'm not going to go over these in, the, in this video. There's some useful stuff in here. Um, if you have boot requirements, you might want to look through those. If you have any kind of uh, specific needs, if your host supports EFI or secure boot, this that type of stuff is going to be in here um, in this VM options menu. Uh, VMware Tools has one useful setting. I mean, it's got a bunch, but one one that you might want to take a quick look at is this uh, VMware to uh, Tools upgrade where check this box, basically every time you power the VM off and on, it'll automatically update VMware tools if there is an update available, um, which I'm gonna do that. So yeah, the rest of these, you can take a look around, but the defaults generally work fine. And I'm gonna hit the next button down here. Here's all of our settings for this VM. You can give them a once over, just make sure it looks good on your end and see if there's any uh, anything that you miss, anything you wanna change, and then just hit finish. And at this point, We'll see down here it's queued up to create that virtual machine completed it's usually a very quick process and i'll go ahead and boot it up just so you can see go ahead and launch the remote console actually i want to do the web console launch web console and yeah i already the it kind of beat me to booting up there so it's booting up for that windows installer that that iso that i have attached and it's working fine so um that and then vmware tools isn't installed so in this case, when it boots up, eh, when, I don't know if Server 2019 has the driver for VMX, uh, VMX3, VMX Net3 for the, uh, the, the network adapter. So I, I may not have a NIC when I boot up, but um, you know it's real easy to install VMware tools. And then just when it comes back up, you'll have a network adapter after that. So uh, yeah, this is how you create a VM in uh, vCenter. I uh, hope this video is helpful to you, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe. Our website has some resources that you might find useful as well. Confused IT is a non for profit organization ran by IT professionals. Our mission is to make IT knowledge more accessible and easier to digest. Thanks for watching.